Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Welcome to the weekly top three, the top three things on our mind here at Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets for the week of September 27th, 2021. The weekly top three is a regular segment on The Michael Dukes Show. The show broadcasts on Facebook Live and via streaming audio from the show's website weekdays from 6 to 8 a.m. I join Michael weekly in the first hour of Tuesday's show from 6.25 to 7 a.m. for a discussion between the two of us about our three issues. We post the podcast of our discussion following the show on the Alaska for Sustainable Budgets Facebook, YouTube, SoundCloud, Spotify, and Substack pages, also on the Alaskans for Sustainable Budget website, as well as the projects page on national blog site, medium.com. You can find past episodes of the weekly top three also at the same locations. Keep in mind that in addition to these podcasts, during the week, you also can follow and participate in the discussion with us of these and other issues affecting Alaska's fiscal and economic condition by following us on the Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets Facebook page and through our posts on Twitter. This week, our top three issues are these. First, we explain why we think House Democrats are leaving middle-income Alaska families to twist slowly in the wind. Second, we discuss why we don't see many signs of progress leading up to Monday's start of the fourth special session. And third, we explain why it's not just us that are concerned about where oil volumes and revenues are headed in the latter half of this decade. And now, let's join Michael. Brad Keithley joins us to talk uh, with number one. We were just talking about it, Andy Josephson. Uh, this is a follow-up to Ivy Sponholz's piece, which he, of course, references back to. They're, they're reinforcing each other's arguments. Uh, but uh, Andy Josephson, he, they've got so much more that they could spend that money on, Brad, that they just, you know, they just can't see giving it to the people because they've got plans. They've got plans for that money. Let's talk about the D's efforts on what's going on here. Yeah, the, this article... Um uh, builds on Ivy's and and in some sense, in some ways, takes it in a in a somewhat different direction. Um, in one significant respect, um, we have I have seen uh, an increasing amount of uh, comments from the D side uh, about opposing taxes. Uh, it started with Zach Fields, uh, who uh, came out strongly. Uh, opposed to taxes, saying we need to take PFD cuts instead of uh, taxes. Um, it shows up in uh, Ivy's uh, proposed plan before Ways and Means to go to a 75-25 uh, split on the PFD and fill in the uh, the, the the remaining uh, deficit with some increase in oil taxes and some increase in in other uh, uh, existing. Uh, taxes, but uh, but not going to uh, broad-based uh, uh, personal tax, and now in Andes it becomes even sharper uh, with uh, uh, with the comments uh, under the alternative plan that he's suggesting in the piece. The people of Alaska would continue to receive robust services, reasonable PFDs, and see little of their own wallets pinched for new large broad-based revenue. I commend to the reader this alternative approach as a reasonable pathway forward. And Bryce uh, Edgman, uh, on several occasions, occasions in House Finance uh, and on the floor, I think, has talked about the need to uh, to avoid uh, broad-based taxes. So we know the thing that intrigues me about this is we know that taxes, either sales taxes or income taxes, would be would take less from uh, the bulk of Alaska families, uh, in the case of sales taxes, would take less from 60% of Alaska families. In the case of income taxes, would take less from about 80% of Alaska families than PFD cuts. And Democrats are always supposed to be about people, about the people, right? They're always supposed to be concerned about middle and lower income working uh, Alaska families. So taxes would take less. Individual taxes would take less from those families than PFD cuts um, and would be better for Alaska families, better for the overall Alaska economy uh, than PFD cuts. So why are Democrats talking uh, about 
preferring PFD cuts and avoiding taxes. Right. And and over time, it's it's I, and and I referenced this in a previous section when I was talking about a debate I was I was involved in uh, last month at some point. Um, over time, uh, it's dawned on me uh, slowly that what Democrats don't want is for the top 20% to become engaged in controlling costs. As long as you use, P as we've talked time and time again on the show, as long as you use PFD cuts to fund government, the top 20% pay a trivial amount uh, uh, toward uh, the cost of government. The bulk of it is pushed off on middle and lower income uh, Alaska families. Um, and, and so what, what, but if you use taxes, uh, there's there's sales taxes to some degree, income taxes to a larger degree, uh, share that burden broadly. I mean, that's what broad-based tax means. Share that burden broadly to include the, include the top 20%. And what Democrats don't want, it's just fascinating to me, what Democrats don't want is for the top 20% to become engaged in looking at government costs. <laughs> politics, As, make, politics make strange bedfellows is what you're saying. <laughs> Well, it does. I mean, it, 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 it's part of this alliance between the Democrats and Natasha, uh, right? I mean, Natasha, you, you don't find Natasha pushing back a lot on government spending. And, and, and the reason is that, you know, as, as I've speculated in the past, there's this unholy alliance between the top 20 percent Republicans who don't want the no taxers and, and the Democrats that – that the top 20% won't push back on costs as long as the Democrats don't try to tax them. So now we're seeing tax the top 20%. So now we're seeing the Democrat part of this and, and what they want to do. I mean, basically the Democrats have made the judgment that, that it's more important to have government programs, to be able to fund government programs, to continue to, 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 to maintain the size of government at its current, if not increased scope. Uh, Andy talks about pre-K, um, to, to maintain government programs and government spending, it's more important to do that than it is to lower the costs of government to middle and lower income Alaska families by broadening the base. And that's that's just a fascinating judgment to me. I mean, it, ab it abandons, who gets caught in that is middle income Alaska families. Most government programs that, that they're concerned about, that they want to maintain, they want to keep sort of deal with the lower income segment uh, uh, of, uh, of, of, of the population, uh, don't really support the middle income uh, segment that much. So, but, but PFD cuts take more from middle income Alaska families, uh, lower middle, middle, and even upper middle take more from middle income Alaska families than a, than a, than a tax would. So what they're really doing is saying, we wanna keep, we wanna keep funding, we wanna keep PFD cuts, because we don't want to engage the top 20% in cost cutting. We want to keep PFD cuts. We want to keep funding. That'll support the lower segment of the population. Keep government programs going. Keep government employees paid. Uh, uh, go down that segment. And we're just sort of, we're just going to abandon the middle uh, uh, segment of Alaska families who don't receive a, a huge amount of benefit from those government programs, but nonetheless pay more uh, through PFD cuts than, uh, than taxes. It's, it's, uh, it, it is they're abandoning they're abandoning their commitment to middle and lower income Alaska families to working Alaska families, particularly abandoning their commitment to middle income Alaska families and just leaving them high and dry, charging them, taking the most uh, uh, of any of the revenue measures, taking the most from middle income Alaska families um, to support government that is not really benefiting middle income Alaska families uh, that much. And this whole this unholy alliance really kind of goes back to what I've been saying for many years, uh, that this is really kind of just the politician's disease of we know better than everybody else how they need to spend their money. Uh, that, you know, I mean, you could see that in Josephson's uh, in his opinion piece here where he talks about things like, 
you know, pre-K, and you guys will get this and you guys will get that. At this point, though, it just seems like the Democrats have jettisoned any kind of cloak of respectability with their constituent base. I mean, historically, Democrats have been, you know, supposedly for the working man, the lower and middle class. They've issued and, and uh, criticized the upper income earners. But now they're like, no, 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 we need to keep those guys occupied over here and, and we're so we can continue to have our money and, and have our, you know, choose the pet projects that we want. I mean, again, the K-12 thing that Josephson was talking about. I mean, that's 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 uh, this this is the this is the new norm, apparently. Yeah. And it's blatant. This makes it blatant, Michael. I mean, it's 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 they're 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 trying to piggyback on the no taxers claim of we're going to keep taxes low on Alaska families um, at the same time as they're using the method that takes that takes the most uh, uh, income out of the pockets of middle and lower income Alaska families. It's just blatant. I mean, once you know the numbers, this is blatant uh, what they're doing. And I, you, so, so you've got the middle in the middle income Alaska families, the, the, the middle uh, 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 60% of Alaska families are just totally being left out on an island someplace. The Republicans aren't protecting them because the Republicans are no taxers. The Democrats aren't protecting them because the Democrats are protecting government spending and protecting, protecting services that employ a lot of government employees uh, uh, to support uh, the lower segments of the income of the income bracket. And you've just got you've got the middle income middle income sixty percent just sort of sitting out there with nobody protecting. Right. Well, and let's let's be honest. The Republicans could be the saviors of the hour here if they would embrace a smaller fiscal footprint. If they would embrace some of the cuts and everything else, they would they don't, wouldn't have to embrace the taxes. They could instead say, "Oh well, we're for you. We're we're for cutting this. We're for doing that. We'll get you back your PFD by making government more you know smaller and more responsible." But they're not. There's just no will to do that either. I mean, that would be the answer that would fix it from having to have this alliance put together. But nobody wants to talk about it. Yeah, it's um, well, and, and and to do that, you'd have to have the support of the top 20 percent. Right. You'd have to have the support of the reps on the Republican side that are really looking out for the top 20 percent. And and they don't want to do it. I mean, I've, I've become convinced that Natasha doesn't want to do it. Burke doesn't want to do it. Uh, Click doesn't want to do it. They want. They don't want to uh, 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 trigger uh, a pushback from the Democrats that would then start pushing for taxes on on the top 20 percent. It's just so they're going to sit in this unholy alliance with the top 20 percent saying, "Hey, we don't have to worry about it." You know, we'll we'll talk a good game occasionally. We'll talk about looking for cost savings, but we really don't want to worry about it because you know we we've we figured out this funding mechanism that doesn't touch us. And the Democrats saying, hey, you know, we're getting all the government we want. We may even get more. And um, and as long as we don't touch the, to- touch the top 20 percent, we're golden. So we'll just keep taking it out of middle income Alaska families, middle and lower income Alaska families through PFD cuts. It's a it, it's a horrible situation for the for for middle income Alaska families. They're just being they're just they're, they're just being taken to the cleaners. Right. Um, uh, uh, through this process. And it's and, and the Democrats, the Democrats have been sort of. Hinting at this, as I say, Zach's talked about it. Bryce has talked about it. Um, uh, Ivy sort of has referred to it from time to time. But Andy's piece makes it absolutely crystal clear what's going on. We're going to jump on the no tax bandwagon. We're going to take your PFD, and, and we're going to do that because we're going to continue government spending, uh, and, uh, and and we're not going to you know we're not going to run the risk of engaging the top twenty percent and pushing back on on government spending. And and that's just the way we're going to. We're going to keep going, um, and and it's and it's disappointing. It's disappointing to see that out of Democrats. Uh, it, you know, they they talk a good game about looking out for working Alaska families, but you know, when push comes to shove, they've just abandoned them uh, and uh, and and gone all in for protecting government spending through taking the by using the means that has the largest adverse impact on. On middle Alaska fam- middle class Alaska families. Well, and you could see the narrative here. You could see it developing. They're, they have a game plan. I mean, you know, first Sponholtz's article, then Josephson's article, reiterating and reinforcing and directing it back to Sponholtz. And so we can expect, you know, opinion pieces to be peppering the papers here over the next week or two with more members that are all going back. That means obviously they've got a plan, and this is what's going on with it. Um, yeah, and 
and one other thing to keep in mind this isn't this isn't the 7525 isn't an original plan it's Jennifer Johnston's old plan from the from the 2019 legislature remember when we had the the working group before I think they called it a task force then that was that was co-chaired by Jennifer Johnston right uh, Shelley Hughes was on it and their solution that came out of that task force was 7525 um so it isn't. This isn't an original plan. It's originally a top twenty percent plan. Right. Well, uh, remember Bert Stedman. Remember Bert Stedman referenced this during one of the meetings where he said, "Oh, we've got a bill coming forward in January that's seventy five twenty five. So I mean, this is again. There's a lot of machinations. You know, you've heard Mike Shower talk about how uh, Bert Stedman and Clip Bishop came out of the office of Louis Stutz right before she shut everything down. I mean, there is definitely some coordination going on here. Uh, in this alliance, and you could see it happening right now. So it's, uh, I mean, it's, it's, it's shocking. But I mean, this is this is the state of Alaska politics at this point. Um, it is, it it is, and no one is. I as I, as I say, no one is. I mean, yes, Dunleavy tried to do uh, spending cuts that would get it back down, but you know, we saw what happened in 2019. He hasn't tried it again uh, again since. There really was no effort. Uh, you know, you even look at the floor amendments on, on the House side and on the Senate side, uh, this budget, there really is no effort to uh, to cut the budget anymore. People talk about it, but they don't really they're not really trying to do it. Right. There's no there's no effort to 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 use taxes. I mean, uh, again, Shower and others and Shelley and others have talked about taxes, but nobody introduced a bill uh, on that side to uh, uh, to do taxes. So it's <laughs> it's really it's just playing out and. And and articles like this sort of reveal what the game plan the game plan is. Right. I mean, this is Brad. I mean, I, and and several people have said it in the chat room this morning. At some point, you know, the, the only way this is going to be fixed, and I've actually opined this at the national level, the only way this is going to be fixed is for the wheels to come off the bus. I mean, it's got to crash at some point because you just can't keep doing this and expect that it's going to be good. And as much as we cry to the heavens, it just seems like the politicians, especially at the national level, for example. They just, I mean, they have no, oh, we'll just raise the debt seal. Oh, we'll do this. Oh, we'll just do that. We'll just print more money. We'll just spend more than we take in. It's all okay. Trust us. We know what we're doing. And, uh, I mean, it's just, it's it's insane. This, I mean, it might be the only solution is that we have to pick up the pieces and try and rebuild it. I mean, that's what it comes down to. But, Michael, I don't, the wheels don't come off the bus for a while longer. Now that they've broken into the PFD, I mean, I I think all this discussion about we're going to have a plan at 75-25 now, I think that's just talk. I mean, when Jennifer Johnston uh, talked about 75-25 and actually had a bill in to do 75-25, and 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 there was a companion bill over in the Senate, and they were going to push ahead with 75-25, they pulled it back when, when the spring forecast, whatever year that was, when the spring forecast came out and showed that they couldn't even balance it at 75-25. So I, I think I think it's just talk. I think it's just a way to delay, uh, you know, people doing other things or, or demanding other things um, uh, by saying, you know, we're going to do seventy five twenty five, and then when the when the numbers show that seventy five twenty five doesn't work, they'll just keep going uh, until the PFD is gone. So I don't, the wheels don't come off the bus uh, in the sense that you know they run out of money, run out of our money, run out of money. Um, until the PFD is entirely gone, and that isn't that isn't tomorrow. Right. It, it probably will be sometime this decade, uh, but that isn't tomorrow. It's just, I mean, nobody. I, the, the problem with this is nobody's protecting uh, middle and lower income Alaska families. Nobody's protecting the overall Alaska economy. They're all in it for their own thing. Top twenty percent's in it to make sure they don't pay for any of it. You know, you can go on as long as they want it to go on, but they're not paying for any of it. Uh, and and Josephson and Sponholtz and Bryce and Zach are telling us that the Democrats aren't concerned about middle income Alaska families either. Right. That they're concerned about government spending and government programs and doing more good for this, that, or the other thing, and getting more government employees out there and making sure, in Zach's case, making sure government unions are are uh, are, are fully funded. Uh, that their employees are fully funded. Uh, construction programs, yeah, we want construction programs, more government construction programs, more union employees. 
I mean, that they're in it for that. Right. Nobody's looking out for nobody's trying to figure out what's the best for the overall Alaska economy or what's the what's the best for uh, middle income families. And it'll just if, if nobody's looking out for them. This has got a while to go before it crashes and burns. Well, and even even when that happens, even when it goes to the end of taking all of the PFD, I think quite honestly, that's just the that's just the beginning because they still have through the POMV, they still have access to a huge pot of money. And maybe they're stuck right now on the whole 5%, but we've seen how much respect they have for the law. Down the road, if they get into a bind and they need more money, then they just may say, well, we'll just take it to 5.5% or 6 or 6.5%. And, I mean, now they have access to the corpus of the fund. I mean, this is a serious issue. It is. And there's other ways to get at the corpus and, and even bigger uh, uh, tranches. Um, uh, uh, one proposal, you, you may remember this a few years back, was to borrow from the from the fund to pay for, in that case, it was oil tax credits. Um, so w- once you get to some point, what you do is you start borrowing from the fund. Right. So the gov- government needs more money. We'll borrow from, we'll tell them we're going to pay it back. We'll borrow from the fund. And you start draining the fund in that way. There's nothing in the Constitution that would protect that. Right. So there are ways to get at the fund. Right. Well, that's worked so well for the CBR. Right. I mean, they borrowed from the CBR. (laughs) They've that's worked so well. It's supposed to be ten billion dollars in the CBR. It's worked so well so far. So, yeah, giving them that opportunity. Oof. I can't even imagine uh, what that would be like. Um, Let's give us a quick tease of number two, Brad. We're about to hit the break. So give me a quick 30 second synopsis of number two and we'll come back to it. Um, the number two is, is, you know, does anybody really care about the fourth special session? Um, uh, the administration, um, uh, has, has talked a good game about uh, proposing, uh, uh, revenue alternatives, uh, but they haven't done it. Uh, they have on their website, on the department of revenue website, they have a spot where they say, you know, compre- or fiscal plan options. Uh, that were that was supposed to be described in August as uh, as as various revenue options, and they were going to go into detail on them. Uh, that website still has a, a a link to it that says, or a, a statement to it that says, "Coming soon." It said that since August. Um, so you know, I, I don't think anybody really thinks that the fourth special session is going to do anything. The administration certainly isn't doing anything to prep for it. Um, so I think. Uh, like those who think it's just going to be a waste of time are, are probably uh, probably have the right side of the bed at this point. So let's talk about the fourth special session um, and uh, and everything that's related to that right now. Let's kick things off there. Well, first thing uh, I mentioned earlier in the chat room, the fourth special, the governor's office confirmed yesterday that the special session is going to start on Monday uh, at two o'clock as opposed to Friday uh, at nine o'clock. Not a doesn't appear on the surface to be a big change. Uh, a more convenience change for people, perhaps, uh, but uh, but but so it's going to start on Monday. What it, whatever whatever the start of it's going to be is going to start on Monday. But but my but the the question is is anybody really serious about it? I mean, so the Democrats are panning uh, what the working group has come up with. Uh, the Democrats are proposing, you know, in the in the. Uh, Andy Josephson piece we just talked about in the Ivy Sponholz piece before that. They're talking about a 75-25 uh, PFD split with uh, with some uh, enhancements to uh, various uh, non-individual uh, revenue options like a slight increase in oil taxes and uh, and that sort of stuff. Um, and and sort of that's what they're bringing into the that's what they're bringing into the special session. The governor called the special session, says he wants a fiscal plan. The governor has proposed a fiscal plan, uh, but his fiscal plan has huge holes, revenue holes in it, because it doesn't cut spending down to the size of the revenues. So you've got these deficits that show up in it. Uh, And the governor hasn't proposed any revenues uh, that fit those holes. Indeed, as I was saying before the break, uh, the Department of Revenue uh, back in August, the commissioner, Lucinda Mahoney, made a presentation to the working group that that was received very well at the time because it was taken as as the governor was finally becoming engaged on revenues. Her conversation with the working group included a number of revenue options, uh, some details on some of those revenue options, 
and then at the in at the time of her presentation in August uh, said uh, we're going to we're going to post a fiscal plan model uh, that would have would enable Alaskans to look at the details of these revenue options and play around with themselves with some of these revenue options by you know increasing that or decreasing that or using this this options instead of that option um, and and there was a colloquy with uh, with uh, uh, one of the representatives on the on the committee um, saying, well, will you even include income taxes on that? And, she, and Mahoney said, well, the governor doesn't support income taxes, but yes, income taxes would be a part of the what's included in the model. So the conversation at that time was, OK, the governor's going to get serious about about revenues that would help fill in the gaps that his proposal, his own fiscal proposal, the, the POMB 5050 proposal uh, would uh, would create. Um, and and I think you know I and others felt okay we're going to get serious here the governor's going to get serious. Well here we are now uh, a month plus later on the on the steps of the fourth special session that's supposed to focus on the governor's the governor wants it to focus on, focus on his fiscal plan um, and this fiscal plan model that DOR was going to come up with post let everybody. Um, be dealing with it, educate Alaskans, allow Alaskans to educate themselves about uh, about the alternatives. On the on the Department of Revenue website, uh, right next to Lucinda Mahoney's picture, it says fiscal plan model coming soon. <laughs> the same thing it said since the very day that uh, that she made uh, made the presentation. In fact, the day she made the presentation, uh, the 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 the. The, the parenthetical behind fiscal plan model said coming on Thursday, whatever the heck date it was uh, in August, that got changed later that day to coming soon and it's been coming soon ever since. So I think I think that's sort of I think that's sort of indicative of how serious even the administration is treating this for a special session. Their own plan requires they've admitted. Mike Showers admitted Shelley Hughes has admitted their own plan requires revenues if you're not going to make the cuts and there's no there's no projection that they're going to make the cuts if you're not going to make the cuts it requires revenue their own plan requires revenues and and even to this day even on the on the steps of the fourth special session they haven't they haven't even rolled out the model that they said they had prepared in august they haven't rolled out the model that uh, that uh, shows uh, uh, shows what those steps might be and and, and enables alaskans to evaluate evaluate what those steps might might be, so I don't I don't think I I don't know if they're going to gavel in gavel out I just I don't know if they're going to slow walk it I don't know if some people are going to try to hold committee meetings uh, probably the Democrats may try to hold committee meetings in that in the House to further this 2575 plan that Ivy and and Andy have talked about uh, but but I don't there, there's no seriousness here. There's no seriousness on the part of the administration of, of putting on the table the pieces, all the pieces that need to be uh, on the table to consider uh, consider their fiscal plan. Would you comment before we move on quickly to number three here? Would you comment? Uh, did you hear Mike Shower's discussion with us last week about how um, you know the, how that nothing's going to change if the leadership makeup? in the Senate specifically, is uh, still going to be the same? Uh, is there anything you can comment on that? Well, yeah, I heard, I, I've listened to that. Uh, I've listened to Mike's comments. I've listened to other other make their comments. Here's the question about it, though. Let's say, let's say the pro-PFD Republicans do do a coup. They do replace Burt. Let's say they're successful in replacing Burt and Click uh, as co-chairs of the Senate Finance Committee, which is where all of this discussion is focused. I, I don't I don't know what stops then Bert, Click, uh, Natasha, and Stevens from going over to the Democrats, forming a coalition with the Democrats, and just continuing on as co-chairs of the Finance Committee. All all that potentially does is take the pro-PFD Republicans and make them the minority. And so I I am I am skeptical that 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 happens because people can count um, and and there's enough non PFD Republicans in the Senate majority that if they flipped over to the Democrats could just continue going down. Now you've got Kawasaki and and Willikowski and maybe they would come over and help form a majority and maybe that 
maybe that uh, puts things together for a pro PFD uh, majority, uh, even if Bert and Natasha and, and, and Click and Gary Stevens flip, um, maybe. Uh, but um, but I I haven't seen evidence yet. I haven't seen statements by enough people that uh, that that reforming in that fashion works. And what do you have? Even if you do that on the Senate side, you've still got the House where it is. Um, and any discussion of restructuring on the House side is is uh, uh, Steve Thompson and and Bert going uh, Bart Lebon going over to uh, going over to the majority, not making the not making right. the pro PFD stronger, but making the the anti the PFD cut side stronger. Right. So even if you reform the Senate, what have you got? What what have you advanced? Uh, well, because the House side is still is still blocked. Do you think that? Uh... That there's a possibility. I mean, if they polled, if, if the Republicans in the Senate, and, and this is what I've been thinking about here the last few days because of Mike, com, Mike Shower's comments on this. Do you think if you had the Scott Kawasaki's, the, the Bill Wilikowski's, the, the, maybe the Donnie Olson's, the Lyman Hoffman, do you have enough support in that to create the Senate majority, a new bipartisan Senate majority, to get around the Stedmans and the and the uh, and the Click Bishops and the Natasha von Imhoffs of the world, do you have enough on that side to come up around? And 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 how does that play out if that is the case? If you do a head count and you have Kawasaki and Wilikowski and Donnie, um, who's Lyman's cousin after all, <laughs> um, come over to the majority side and you lose, but you lose Stevens. Uh, Natasha, um, uh, 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 Stedman, and and Click. Um, yeah. Then yeah yeah you have so you have you have three to replace three. You have Donnie, Kawasaki, and Wilikowski come over. You have three to replace three, and and yes, uh, you do have a majority. But there's two. But but there's several questions about that. Where does David Wilson go? Right. David Wilson has been as as flaky as as anybody has as, as I've seen in the legislature over the last uh, several years um, and and does David Wilson stick with the uh, with the with the PFD uh, Republicans um, does does Lyman stick I mean Do Lyman is the king of playing games and he's got he and Donnie uh, and does he stick or does he you know see some advantage to his issues by going over with the Democrats, going with Stevens and and Stedman, um, and if they go, if he and Donnie, if Donnie sticks on the Democrat side and Lyman goes with uh, Stevens and Stedman, then even if Wilikowski and 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 Kawasaki would come over, that's not that's not enough. So right. it's it's um it, it's a there's a lot of ifs ands and buts in there, and then but but to to, to me, Michael, the bigger question is, okay, you get the Senate reorganized. What's that done? You right. got you got a Senate reorganized now. You got a Senate focused on your issue. Let's say they can stick together and they go for a 50-50 PFD and they they have a bill that uh, uh, that um, uh, uses a, a, a draw from the an excess draw from the ERA as as bridge financing as the governor proposes, and they just ignore the holes that the governor has in the revenue you know, on his revenue side and the in the out years. And so they don't do any new revenue. You, got, you get everything you want from the Senate, but then you've got the House, and the House is still is still organized the way it is. Um, and you and you know you're going to lose Thompson and Laban when when push comes to shove on any vote, even if the House organization stays the same way it is. You know you're going to lose Thompson and Laban on any vote that's that's important. Um, so what have you accomplished on the Senate side now? You know, maybe Shower would say, "Well, at least we got the Senate, and we'll work on the House." And, and maybe, maybe that's true. Uh, but but it's there's a lot of ifs, ands, or buts, a lot of a lot of uh, shakiness going on. And if you got David Wilson on your side, let's say you got David Wilson on your side. Well, David Wilson, like Natasha, has said, "No revenues. I'm not going to. I'm not right. going to have taxes. I'm not going to save PFDs at the expense of taxes." Right. Um, so, you know. Or even if you're counting on all those, even if you got the Senate reorganized, you're counting on David Wilson. When push comes to shove, you need revenues to, to do POMV 5050 to hold a budget together on POMV 5050. So David Wilson may flake on you. So right. it's 
it, it's very it's it's there's a yes you can create a scenario under which it might work but uh but it's very uh, uh I, I would say it's very shaky so you've got uh stedman uh click bishop natasha von imhoff uh gary stevens and well josh revac as well because revac's going to go where von imhoff tells him to go so that's five yeah. for sure that's five for sure that would have to be ousted which leaves us with again you'd have to be able to find four or five uh and that's if wilson stayed with it i mean it's it's a th- it's thin it's super thin no matter what's going on yep and and will they go through that process in this in the senate if if they if if the house isn't going to reorganize along with them is it going to be worth those people to be you know to be jumping on one side or the other Lyman in particular is it worth is it going to be worth Lyman jumping on one side or the other if um, if the house isn't going to reorganize as well so yeah maybe but but it's not clear to me that that happens um, good good pickup on Revac he certainly yeah he certainly goes with Natasha um, it, it's not clear to me if that happens um, and even if it does it's not clear that uh, that it does anything because of what goes over on the house side mm, man. I mean, this is a mess, Brad. I mean, I, I just, I don't know when, I just don't know when our politicians are going to get a dose of reality. I mean, here we are living in, uh, we've living in a continuing fiscal crisis uh, at the state level, recession to pandemic, continuing depressed economy, all the problems we have, a legislature that has lived out of the, the piggy bank for the last dozen years. And and here we are. I mean, you know, and again, the, the whining from Josephson about how, oh, well, this is going to put us in a this leaves us little fiscal breathing room. I mean, we're going to be living paycheck to paycheck. Well, welcome to the real world, pal. I mean, this is what everybody else is doing. And yes, you are living paycheck to paycheck because you're spending more than you're taking in. There's your problem. And uh, and yet nobody is willing to acknowledge it or address it. They just it's delay, delay, delay. The real dynamic here, Michael, to me, is the top 20% not being engaged. I mean, they've figured out a way where government can go on in a way that they don't have to, they don't have to contribute to it, um, using, using PFDs, PFD cuts as a way to finance it. And, and as long as they're not engaged in the effort, not engaged in the effort of controlling government spending, uh, or not engaged in the effort of 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 you know restructuring to make this thing fair, uh, it's not going to happen. I mean, the top twenty percent have enough representatives on the Senate side and on the House side, particularly if the Democrats have joined with them, uh, to, uh, to to block anything. So right. that to me, that's that's the dynamic that is peculiar to this state that doesn't happen in other states. In other states, Texas, you know, other states that that do control spending. The top 20% is engaged. They're concerned about about government spending. Here, uh, we've managed uh, to they've managed to create a structure where they don't they don't worry about it. So uh, that to me is the dynamic that that, that where we're lacking. Yeah, it's um, so frustrating. It's just so frustrating to see it, and and maybe that's the curse of you know when somebody's outside the system, they can always see. Some of the, you know, they're they're not too close to the sea, the trees, to the forest kind of thing. Maybe that's maybe that's where we're at. I mean, I guess uh, those of us in the valley have got some marching orders when we could see if Wilson is going to be one of the sticking points. Maybe we go back to the charter of changes, and maybe we need to start replacing some of those. But again, we're even stymied in that area because places like Sitka and Kodiak keep sending back their senators and representatives time and time and time again. Uh, you know, and and we can change out all the players that we want on our end, but if those people remain in there with all their institutional knowledge and their power and and the 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 momentum that they've created over being in there for decades, it it's almost an impossible it's almost an impossible uh, uh, task at that point. Well, it's challenging. We'll see what redistricting does. I mean, redistricting may help a little bit, but uh, um, it's certainly it's certainly challenging. Yeah, and of course, on top of that, the uh, uh, jungle primary and the ranked choice voting will be another one as well. Let's run on real quick here to number three, uh, where we're talking about um, um, uh, we're talking about that forecasting, um, and that we're not the only ones that are worried about it. Uh, give us a quick uh, ninety-second, two-minute hit here. 
there's a there's a good article in the uh, Alaska Journal of Commerce uh, last week by Elwood Bremer um, that's titled "Once Heralded Slope Renaissance Projects Now Face Uncertain Futures," and it talks about uh, the Willow Project being slowed down uh, as a result of the district courts, the federal district courts decision, and the need to go back for a new uh, EIS, a supplemental EIS. And it talks about uh, PICA, the uncertainty of PICA. The same thing, same things we've talked about on the show. Sometimes I get people after the show saying, "Oh no, you're being too pessimistic." Well, it's not just me. Uh, the Alaska Journal of Commerce, which is as pro industry as any publication out there. Uh, is expressing the same concern about these projects, and and it's not just it's not just the projects. Then that backs up into the budget because the budget the budget's predicated on 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 these on these volumes coming uh, coming to fruition. Uh, if they don't, then the then the the back end of the budget is uh, back end of the revenue forecast is is uh, is not realistic. And they're, of course, still having problems getting financing because of the banking on the Arctic and everything. I mean, it's all this is this perfect storm. Uh, it's the perfect poo parade here for everything to come about. It's not a good time for Alaska oil and gas uh, with the way things are going right now. Brad Keithley, Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Thanks for coming in and joining us, my friend. Michael, as always, thanks for having me. Well, that's a wrap for another week's edition of the weekly top three from Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Thank you again for joining us. Remember that you can find past episodes on our YouTube, SoundCloud, Spotify, and Substack pages. And keep track of us during the week on Facebook and Twitter. This has been Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. We look forward to you joining us again next week on the Weekly Top 3.